Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our fifth session of Lawyers as Leaders. Uh, today, we are privileged to be talking to Professor Randy Barnett. So, Professor Barnett, thank you so much for, uh, for giving us the benefit of this conversation, for talking to us about your career. So, I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, before we begin, a few logistical matters. Uh, please remember to turn in your questions on time every week. Uh, I use those questions to prepare for these sessions, and so do our speakers. And I know it's unusual to have to do the reading so far in advance, but it really helps us understand what's on your mind and how we can best use this time together. And finally, I'd like to recognize uh, Ava Schlitz and Holly Chenault, the TAs who helped organize today's session. And I think the questions are really, really quite remarkable. And I want to thank again, Dean Hillary Sale for helping us think through this session and this course as a whole. Um, our speaker today, Professor Randy Barnett, is the Patrick Ho-Tung Professor of Constitutional Law, and he's the director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. After graduating from Northwestern University and Harvard Law School, he tried many felony cases as a prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney Office in Chicago. Professor Barnett has been a visiting professor at Penn, at Northwestern, uh, and at Harvard Law School. Uh, his publications, he's written 11 books, more than 100 articles and reviews, as well as numerous op-eds. And his academic work has been featured in many law journals, including those at Georgetown, Michigan, Harvard, and Yale. In 2004, he argued the medical marijuana case of Gonzalez versus Raich before the United States Supreme Court. And then in 2012, he was one of the lawyers representing the National Federation of Independent Business in its constitutional challenge to the Affordable Care Act in NFIB versus Sibelius. Professor Barnett has also appeared in numerous documentaries, including PBS's Constitution USA with Peter Sagal and a more or less perfect union with Judge Douglas Ginsburg. Fun fact about Professor Barnett, he portrayed a prosecutor in the 2010 science fiction feature, Inalienable, the movie. His specialties are constitutional law and contracts, but primarily constitutional law in recent years. He began teaching at the Law Center in 2006. So welcome, Professor Barnett. So glad you're joining us today. Well, I'm uh, very grateful to be here, Bill. Grateful to be at Georgetown and um, uh, the, grateful for the questions that the students asked, which were 100% interesting. And I, I'm going to try to keep my answers shorter so we can get to more of them. But nobody asked me any questions about the movie Inalienable. I'm a little disappointed. Well, we're going to work that in. So don't worry. <laughs> uh, so let's, uh, let's start with the biographical questions. The articles for this week describe your decision to become a lawyer at age 10 after watching The Defenders on TV. What was it about the depiction of lawyering that inspired you to pursue a legal career? Yeah, well, when I grew up, Perry Mason was a very popular show you'd watch on Sundays. And that did not make me want to be a lawyer. Uh, Perry Mason was really about solving murders and getting confessions from the, the real, the true murderer from the witness stand on cross-examination. And we, we, we enjoyed it in my family, but it didn't make me want to be a lawyer. When the Defenders came on in 1962, it was about a father-son criminal defense team in New York. It was filmed on location in New York. Uh, so it was very gritty and realistic. Uh, involving a lot of social issues. Every episode did involve cases and it raised social issues, but they also broke ground because they had a lot of guilty clients they were defending. Everybody wasn't innocent, like in Perry Mason. And I think what made, it was watching that show that made me want to be a lawyer uh, for two reasons. One is because it was a show about being a lawyer, which is something Perry Mason and most lawyer shows are not. LA Law later on was about being a lawyer, but most shows are, lawyer shows are about crime, crime dramas. This was about the ethical issues that were arose in the, in the practice of criminal law. So that was the immediate reason that made that show different than other shows. Uh, but also it was about justice and that that concept, the concept of justice is the sort of unifying theme of my whole career. It is what has motivated me to do everything that I've done. Um, it all comes from some association with a commitment to justice and seeing that justice is done and being very uh, uh, upset or uh, uh, disturbed by a lack of justice when I see injustice. That's, I mean, it's um, it is really very striking, and and so the idea of representing people and being the champion of justice, you know, helped frame your career, what you wanted to do. Right. 
Right. And then, of course, I, as you noted, I became a prosecutor, not a defense lawyer. I was uh, it, almost equally interested in being a defense lawyer. I thought about being a public defender in Chicago as opposed to a prosecutor. And I know there were people from the murder task force in the public defender's office when I was interning there at the state's attorney's office who tried to get me to join the defense side. And I think if I could have been assured of getting onto the murder task force or something like it, I might have actually really seriously thought about doing it that way. But I ended up being a prosecutor in part because, I mean, in large part, um, uh, because the ethical obligation of a prosecutor is to do justice, whether that means going forward with a prosecution or dropping uh, charges and dropping prosecution. So uh, our, the ethical obligation of a defense attorney is to their client. And that is a very essential part of our justice system. We would not be the same without it. But I like the idea that a prosecutor could, does not, didn't have to win, didn't have to prevail. Uh, they could drop charges, and that was their ethical obligation as well. And in fact, as a prosecutor, when I was on felony review, which I did a, a job I did for six or seven months, which was the most uh, interesting part of uh, being a prosecutor, felony review in Chicago is where um, uh, every no felony charges can be brought in Cook County without a state attorney signing off on it. And that means there has to be a full-time unit of state's attorneys who go to the police stations and interview witnesses, interview the suspects, um, assist the police, tell the police what needs to be done before approving a case. Um, and, uh, and so we have to be involved at, the, at that phase. And so we don't go to court. It's a full-time unit. You work a 12-hour night shift or a 12-hour day shift. You have your own squad car um, uh, that you take to different places. Um, and you, your job is to disapprove cases. And our approval rate in those days was about 60%. So it meant 40% of the cases where the police actually asked us for felony charges, we said no. That was our job. That's, uh, was there a case that you remember was particularly memorable or that it had a particularly large impact on you? Well, there's, there's so many cases in felony review that we could spend a couple hours just talking, be reminiscing <laughs> the stuff that happened to me while I was on felony review. I suppose the most memorable case I worked on felony review was where I took confessions in a triple homicide where uh, four gang members had uh, viciously stabbed to death uh, three young boys, younger, you know, te teen boys, uh, boys in their late teens um, who had been trying to buy marijuana and they went into uh, buy it from gang members where that's, who, that's when, when marijuana is illegal, you have to buy them from criminals and those guys didn't have any marijuana uh, to sell them. So they said, no, we don't have any. But then they thought that these, guys, these boys thought that they didn't trust them. So they started talking about all the Latin uh, eagles that they knew, this gang. But it turns out they were talking to the Latin kings. And at that point, then the Latin king says, oh, yeah, we can find you some marijuana. And they took them into their, they drove them in their car and they took them into an alley. And one by one, they stabbed them to death oh uh, for having boasted about being associated with the Latin eagles and writing on hits on Latin kings, all of which was false, by the way. If they'd actually been members of the gang, they would have known they weren't dealing with Latin Eagles. Um, and uh, I took the confessions from two of those people that not, you know, when they were arrested, one was a, a, an oral confession to me, the other was a court reporter confession, which, um, uh, and at the end of the court reporter's confession, after, you know, you get the, you take the oral statement, then you take a court reported version of that statement. You're spending a lot of time with the, with the suspect. And then after he had signed the confession, I asked him if he had it to do all over again, would he do it again? And he said, well, I, if it was a sure thing, and I said, well, there's no such thing as a sure thing. And then he said, uh, well, a lot of kings have killed people without getting caught. I said, yeah, but, but you got caught. Would you do it again? And he said, well, I'd have killed the first one, Michael, for sure. He's the one that was doing all the talking. I'm not sure about the other two. So that was probably one of my most memorable cases on felony review. My most memorable case as a trial lawyer was probably a case in which I had to try twice because it was two brothers who had murdered, uh, again, uh, again, stabbed to death. Uh, the former cellmate of one of the brothers, who was also a marijuana dealer. They were going to rip him off for his marijuana and his money that they thought would be there. Um, and because each brother confessed to being there, but each one said the other brother did it, I had to try each case separately um, to jury trials. And during the second trial of, of George King, as opposed to Robert King, um, uh, the defense lawyer, who was my former supervisor in the state's attorney's office, one of the head of the criminal division, he was the head of the criminal division, uh, was was cross-examining my investigator and he started asking, a he asked a question that was obviously eliciting hearsay. And you can tell by the form of the question, it's a hearsay question. Did, 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 did officer, investigator Markham, during the course of your investigations, you have occasion to learn? Well, that anything that follows that is going to be hearsay. You can object to it and you would object to it. But when I hear, when he asked the question, 
I didn't object to it. And uh, then there was a series of hearsay questions that I didn't object to. The judge, who was a stickler for evidence, started glaring at me, thinking I'd lost my mind. But he knew me, at least he knew me well enough not to interject, which he would like, uh, he might have done. My partner, who I was training, uh, was shifting in his seat, thinking I'd gone crazy. Uh, but so my proudest moment as a prosecutor was not objecting to that hearsay line of questioning uh, and letting it come in. And, and uh, at the uh, next recess, um, the defense lawyer told his client the following. He said, well, George, it looks like they're letting us have their defense, our defense. They must not think it hurts them that much, which was exactly right. It was, uh, what he was just seeking to elicit through hearsay was stuff that I had considered proving myself. But I thought, A, I would be hard, it would be hard for me to prove it. Uh, it was hearsay, and I'd have to prove it up. And B, I thought it w I would not be allowed to prove it if it would be prosecutorial misconduct if I tried to prove it. It would be, admiss it would be objected to and be excluded. Uh, but the fact that he was doing it for me, I thought, well, this is great. Um, and uh, But I was able to make that, you have to make that decision in the fraction of a second it takes from a question being asked to a question being answered. And I did that whole calculation while that was happening. And I would say my failure to object to a hearsay question was my proudest moment as a trial lawyer. Hmm. The other one I would say was when I got a defense psychiatrist to change his opinion on the witness stand in front of a jury from the defendant would have been, from the, def from the opinion he stated on direct examination, which was the defendant would not be cap uh, competent, he would not be uh, 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 um, mentally competent. Uh, and on cross-examination, I got him to change his opinion. So he said he would be mentally competent. That was probably one of my, and there's a whole secret to how I did that, but we don't have time to talk about that. So, and when we were you doing this, did you think that you would then go into academia after being a prosecutor? Um, yes, uh, because halfway, when I was an undergraduate, I thought about being, not going to law school and going to be a philosophy professor, getting a PhD in philosophy, because I discovered philosophy, which I'd never heard of in high school. And philosophy turns out to be the study, part of philosophy, political theory and ethical philosophy is the study of justice, which is my animating interest. And I didn't realize there was a whole discipline devoted to that. So I had, I was, I had a mentor uh, at Northwestern where I was an undergraduate Henry v named Henry Veach, a natural law theorist of some repute. Um, and um, I thought about not going to law school and getting a PhD in philosophy, but I changed my mind when he was sort of driven out of the department at Northwestern um, uh, because he had sided with some graduate students who had been uh, sexually uh, uh, abused by uh, some of his colleagues in the philosophy department. Um, and um, they drove, and, the, and the, the department closed ranks behind the professor. And they, they, drew, they basically life, made life so difficult for him that he left, he decamped to be the chair of the Georgetown philosophy department. And I thought, this academia is too dirty a business for me. I, if, with, he's a, a senior chaired, politically correct professor as a mainstream liberal Democrat. And with somebody with my views, if academia would just be too dirty. So I thought, that uh, being a criminal lawyer would actually put me into a cleaner system than academia would be. And I went back to being uh, my plan A, which was to be a lawyer. And it was halfway through law school, however, that I realized I could be a law professor talking and writing about the same things I might have done as a philosophy professor. So uh, I had already thought about that as a possible career move after being a prosecutor, not realizing how unusual it is to go in those days from being a county prosecutor to a a tenured, uh, an actual tenure track law professor. It was hard even then, very hard. I had to go through the job market twice to get a job. Um, and, uh, but I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be, but it was my goal even when I graduated from law school. So there are a couple of things I want to follow up on. And I want to talk about kind of your discovering libertarian views and, and how that came about. But I wanted to, uh, I've got one question from a student uh, about your, about being a prosecutor that I wanted to to ask you. Uh, would you explain how your views on justice intersect with the disproportionate nature of our disproportionate effect of our system minorities and people of color? Yeah, well, it, it's certainly true. Um, but as a prosecutor, you don't deal with systemic issues. You take one case at a time. Um, and so the, the, the goal for me was to make sure I, I was doing the right thing in each and every case, regardless of the race or orientation of the particular offender, um, which I believe, you know, we all believe we do. Um, we don't know if we've made a mistake because we, we based, go based on the evidence. And so I'm sure some of the people I prosecuted were not guilty, but I have no idea which ones they were. Uh, 
um, ultimately, I couldn't know for, in sort of a metaphysical sense of how guilty they were. I could only go on the basis of the evidence I had in front of me. Um, uh, I did. There, I was involved as a, with a law student with one case of somebody who was wrongfully accused. Uh, and it was discovered as a result of an anonymous phone call to the prosecutor's office. And then we had to bring the guy back and, and, and he had to with, give an opportunity to withdraw his plea. And, but none of us could figure out, none of us figured out that this was a bad case where the cop had lied until we got an anonymous tip, which explained why it was happening. And then we, all of a sudden the pieces fell into place. When I worked on it as a law student, I took the file home and I went over it with my dad to say, there's something I don't understand about this file. Can you help me figure it out? And we couldn't figure it out. And then when we got this anonymous phone call, it provided the key fact we didn't know that caused us to figure it out. But other than rare instances of like that, you don't know that you've made a mistake. Um, and the reason I went from being, a, this is the reason why, another question is why did I go from being a prosecutor to being a, a law professor? It's exactly the question, what underlies this question. Because being a law professor, you can address this, the system. You can talk about how the system should be changed, how the system should be reformed as a whole rather than dealing with justice case, one case at a time. There's nothing wrong with dealing with justice one case at a time, but you can't change the system that way. And being a law professor, you can. And that was what my earliest writings were about, how to, how to reform crim the criminal justice system. So, so let's get, just kind of drop back to talk a little bit about your philosophy. So um, one of the profiles that we asked the students to read for today, you talk about discovering libertarian views. And you mentioned that you think that these are also the views that your father held but neither you nor he had known that was an option. Can you talk more about your father and the kind of, so first, you know, let's talk about your father and the kind of influence he had on you and then talk about your discovery of liber libertarianism. Yeah, I got my, both my outlook on life and my po politics from my dad. And my outlook on life I would describe as contrarian. Um, which I didn't know that I was a contrarian until like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, because I always thought that contrarian meant you were a negative person and I'm kind of a positive person. I kind of see the glasses as half full, not half empty, but contrarian just means you kind of go against the grain. My dad was like that uh, to a fault, actually. I mean, just to give you an idea, uh, it, back in those days, all households were either Chevy, Ford or Chrysler families, and you were very committed to the brand. Chevy, of course, Horse being the number one bestseller, Ford being the number two bestseller. Well, guess which car we liked in our family? It had to be Chrysler because they had the best drive train. My dad was an automobile mechanic in addition to being in the laundry business. And so it was just objectively the best. And it didn't matter that no one else felt that way. You like, you had McDonald's, Burger King, second, McDonald's most popular, Burger King second most popular. Well, we went, in our family, we like Prince Castle, which is a regional chain you've never heard of because it has the best hamburgers. So, um, Whenever I'm in a group, I'm always figuring out like what's wrong with the group. And it doesn't matter if I'm in a group of Georgetown professors uh, where I'm the minority or if I'm in a group of libertarians. I, I, I tend to uh, look for what's wrong with what they're saying. And oftentimes many libertarians disagree with what I'm saying. Um, so this is kind of endemic to me. And it's a character flaw in some sense. Um, but it's very helpful if you want to be an academic because it does you can see things and find things to write about where things, other people are getting things wrong that if you're really a mainstream or group thinker person, if you're kind of with everybody else, it's hard for you to come up with anything novel to say because you're just making a variation on what everybody else thinks. Whereas I just look at what everybody else think and I typically think, well, here's what's fundamentally wrong with that, which by the way, also made me a very bad law student because I was just trying to figure out what was wrong with what my professors were saying rather than get inside their head and figure out what they knew, which is what I should have been doing. Um, so that is, and, and as for where I got the libertarianism from, I got my political principles from my dad, who was a, cons a conservative, um, and I would have considered myself a kind of a, a, a William Buckley National Review kind of conservative until my junior year in college when I met a, a junior classics professor at Northwestern who was a libertarian, and after nine months of arguing with him about this, I finally kind of decided he was right, and I was wrong, and by my senior year, I taught a a, a student organized seminar for credit in my residential college on libertarianism. So, and then I went to law school as a libertarian. And what made uh, you find libertarianism compelling? Well, at first I thought, when I first heard it, well, here's a, cons a philosophically consistent conservatism, but that had some implications that were not conservative. Drug legalization is one of the most obvious ones and other things can go along with it as well. Uh, and 
I resisted all of those things on kind of policy grounds. But once I realized this really was consistent, or I thought it was consistent at the time, um, I was prepared to buy into some of the conclusions that were counterintuitive to me as a conservative. And, um, and that also involved, you know, stances about foreign policy and non intervention, you know, non intervention in, you know, for, you know, other war, you know, not starting wars and going to war so often. Um, and so um, there were a number of things about libertarianism that I found appealing, but mostly it was the fact that it just seemed right. And it seemed and it provided kind of a theory of justice, which was that the government should not violate the pre existing rights of we the people. Is there a philosopher who you find particularly compelling who kind of influences your thought more than others? Uh, well, I consider from an, uh, from a, I consider myself an Aristotelian Thomist, uh, but mostly Aristotel, er, well, Arist Thomistic version of Aristotle because my, my professor Henry Beach was uh, Aristotelian Thomist. And so uh, he then, that's when I, that's where I got my ethics from. And then, so that makes me a natural law person when it comes to ethics. Um, and then when it comes to political theory, I consider myself a Lockean um, uh, but Locke is just a single example of many natural rights thinkers that grew up in the Enlightenment, and he's just one of the most prominent ones. Um, uh, but there's, uh, other than him, I don't think there's any one in particular. Um, uh, I was influenced by some libertarian thinkers who are more obscure, um, but uh, that's who I would cite today. And so in terms of kind of your constitutional vision, is libertarianism you know, at the core of it, or what would you say the relationship is? Um, well, it's, it's at the core of my political views, but my political, political views are not identical to my constitutional views, because my constitutional views have to do with the U.S. Constitution, which is not a perfectly libertarian doctrine, and the system we have is not a perfectly libertarian system. Uh, I, I have written an article about how the Constitution, if followed, would be probably the most libertarian form of government one could one would have in you know in the world uh, if it was all followed um, but that doesn't make it libertarian per se it's just on a on a, on a sliding scale it's, it would be more libertarian I think if the constitution were followed than not so I, I don't equate one with the other um, I do think that we have on balance a good constitution unlike others who don't think that um, as amended I don't I don't defend the original constitution I should be clear I I, I don't think, feel I need to I just have to defend the legitimacy of the constitution that's been amended with its amendments. Um, and then I think it's a good constitution or it's a good enough constitution uh, to stick with uh, uh, in the absence of something better. So, um, so let me talk about, you know, one of the question or a series of questions that we got were about your kind of move from scholarship to, you know, litigation. Um, so how did you get involved in constitutional litigation? Um, well, first of all, how I got involved in constitutional law was I had, I was not a, a fan of constitutional law at all as a student. And one of the questions does relate, did pick up on this from one of the bios of me, which is I was a student of Larry Tribe at Harvard, who was a fine teacher. Nothing, this was nothing about him, but, um, uh, the case book, we used Gunther's case book. And every time I got to one of the parts of the Constitution, like the Ninth Amendment, for example, that says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, I would then turn the page of the textbook and I would see that, oh, well, that doesn't, the Supreme Court's already said that doesn't really mean anything. And when I got to any of the parts of the Constitution that I, I thought were good, um, or I got to the Lochner case, let's say, which I thought, wow, that's a great case. And I would turn the page that, oh, you're supposed to hate that case. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was done with uh, <laughs> with, with constitutional law, my class is a 2L, it was a 2L course. I was done with the constitution. I felt like if the Supreme Court's not gonna pay attention to the constitution and take it seriously, then why should I? So I went to be a criminal lawyer and I, had, I wrote as a law student about criminal justice reform. Uh, and I had written, I had published in ethics when I was a law student. It was published, my, wrote it my, between my first and second year of law school and it was published in ethics by my third year. And a follow up article in the American Journal of Jurisprudence about con criminal justice reform. So by the time I got to be a law professor, I was kind of tired of criminal law and I wanted something completely different. Con law was the farthest thing from my mind and I became a contracts professor because I wanted to do about what is justice in contracts. What, and then I developed the consent theory of contract, which is my answer to what is justice in a contract situation. And then I got sort of involuntarily, gradually pulled into constitutional law. How did that come about? 
uh, it came about because I was invited to speak at the fifth annual student symposium of the Federalist Society. And I didn't know anything about the Federalist Society. There hadn't been one when I was a law student. And I thought it was a monolithically conservative organization and I'm a libertarian. So I thought, well, I mean, I'm sure they're good people, but it's not going to be anything that interests me. But there was a, it, I was invited to be in this conference which at Stanford Law School. And I was a professor at Chicago Kent, you know, relatively unknown. Um, and it was all these prominent people. I was going to be on the program with them, all these judges and everybody, professors. And I thought, well, I wanted to do it. And I but I told the guy who invited me, the student who invited me, you know, Brian, I don't do the Constitution. He goes, oh, well, you're a smart guy. You, can, you only have to talk for 10 minutes. You can think of something to say. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And then I wrote this piece uh, on freedom of association. And the punchline to it was, well, you know, freedom of association is not actually mentioned in the first, it's considered a First Amendment doctrine, but the First Amendment doesn't say anything about freedom of association per se. So the punchline of my speech was, I know what you're thinking. What gives lifetime appointed, you know, un unelected lifetime appointed judges the power to find a, 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 a right that isn't in the Constitution? And then I read the words of the Ninth Amendment and um, got a big ovation for that talk. And I thought, well, first of all, the Federal Society isn't as monolithic as I thought it was. It turns out it's a coalition of conservatives and libertarians. So libertarians are welcome. And secondly, you know, I got tenure now, maybe I can, I know the Ninth Amendment is kind of a disreputable topic, but you know, maybe uh, with tenure, I ought to be able to write about it if it's still in the constitution, it hasn't been repealed. So I'll just write about it. And I got a research assistant to go out and find me everything that had ever been written about the Ninth Amendment. And he came back with a stack of photocopy papers that was about this thick. And then a little book called The Forgotten Ninth Amendment by Bennett Patterson. And I thought, you know, if I read everything in that stack of photocopy papers, that will make me the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment. And that's not a big snack. So I'll just go for it. And guess what? I became the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment. Um, and then the next thing I worked on after that, that was the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment. And then I worked on the original meaning of the Second Amendment um, after that. And I wasn't an originalist. I, Ronald Dworkin had been my professor at, 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 of jurisprudence at Harvard. And I would have considered myself to be a Dworkinian. And uh, but I was starting to do, I was, you know, doing all this work on the original meaning of the Second Amendment, all this work on the original meaning of the, of the Ninth Amendment, and I, my audiences, whether they were originalists or not, really cared about that, and I started caring about it, and so I had cognitive dissonance that set in, and I thought, well, why do I care about this? And eventually, it, it's what led me to be an originalist. Once I discovered a, a version of originalism, I thought I could be for. You know, you're, now, you uh, asked me how I... But oh, actually, sorry, go ahead. Just one thing, you know, the... Uh, you know, in case our students don't know this, you know, your work on the Ninth Amendment was incredibly influential, you know, and, and you know, I remember, I think it might have been one of the first times I heard your name. Uh, I was in graduate school and Bernard Balin, who was really kind of the great historian of the 18th century, you know, all of, all of a sudden started to discuss your work on the Ninth Amendment. So it was really, I, I've never told you that, but- You, you never know, told me that. Yeah, but it just shows kind of the influence that you were having. Um, so, so now let's talk about, so is that, you know, once you started to do the research uh, on the Ninth Amendment, the Second Amendment, that led you to become an originalist? Yeah, because I felt I cared about this and I, should, I wasn't supposed to care about it because I wasn't an originalist. And then I taught, I was teaching a seminar at Boston University and, and, and a, there was an anthology by Sandy Levinson that had a footnote in one of the articles in it that referenced a book called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery by a man named Lysander Spooner that was published in 1845. Uh, and I knew Spooner from being a libertarian because he wrote a very famous uh, kind of anti-US Constitution essay called no, um, uh, called no Treason, the Constitution of No Authority that libertarians like a lot. And I liked it as an undergraduate. But I didn't know anything about Spooner. Uh, uh, I didn't know he wrote anything else. And then I asked the library, what could he possibly have said in 1845 about the unconstitutionality of slavery? So I had the library bring me a copy of it. Turns out it's a whole book, 280 page book that was part of a six volume collected works of Lysander Spooner that I didn't imagine that. And I read this book and in this book, Spooner utilized what we would today call original meaning originalism. He actually refers to original meaning in his book as a refutation of the Garrisonians view of the constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, because the founders intended to protect slavery. And Spooner said, it doesn't matter what they intended, what matters is what they wrote. 
And what they wrote was essentially not a reference to slavery. They never even ma- named slavery, used slavery by name. And, but basically what appealed to me about this was that it was an answer to all the problems with originalism that I was aware of. Um, and I thought, well, this is a theory of originalism that I can do something with, the Spooner's theory of originalism. Little did I know, first of all, it was a lot of people's theory of originalism developed at that time. Uh, um, and it was what, was, and other people like Justice Scalia were already moving in that direction. They had already moved in that direction. I just wasn't part of it and I didn't know about it. Towards original, away from original framers intent and towards original public meaning as the theory of originalism, which is what, as you know, I've worked on theoretically. But it was, it was, it all was caused by the cognitive dissonance of working on the Second and Ninth Amendments, coupled with coming across this book by Lysander Spooner. That's how I became, I'm probably the only person in the country that became an originalist because of Lysander Spooner's book, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. Uh, that's probably true. <laughs> uh, and, I, you know, and I think actually when we were originally talking about this class, one of your focuses was gonna be kind of your work on you know, the anti-slavery theorists and the way in which you know, your vision of the constitution draws on them. Right. Uh, so I think you probably already circulated my writings on that. And then before we bait and switch the students so they didn't have to read those writings. So they have access to them if, they, if you didn't take them back. Because uh, uh, I ended up devoting a lot of effort and time to learning about them. And I've rediscovered that Spooner was not the only one. And in fact, um, I, I eventually came to think he was wrong about the US Constitution, frankly, on public meeting grounds. And I've sided more with uh, 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 figures like Sam and Chase, who was one of the founders of the Liberty, Free Soil, and Republican parties and became Chief Justice of the United States. I thought he was closer to being accurate about the original meaning of the Constitution. Um, so, but still, it was the methodology that Spooner had, had identified that is what appealed to me. So now, so let's shift to, you know, from your kind of scholarly work to, to your work on race. Right. How did that come about? It was the Ninth Amendment, Bill, believe it or not. So this actually ties up to, because there was a case called uh, uh, United States versus Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative pending in the Northern District of California. And it was the federal government trying to shut down a, a cooperative that sold marijuana, medical marijuana pursuant to the Compassionate Use Act, which was the California state law that authorized marijuana. And so the federal government was, shutting, was trying to shut them down and they were being defended by a law firm named Morrison Enforcer and, a, and its individual lawyer was the lawyer for the cooperative named Robert Rach. And in the trial court, uh, uh, Justice Breyer's brother, Charles Breyer, um, asked the parties to brief the Ninth Amendment because he thought the Ninth Amendment would be relevant to the case. And so they had to add something to their brief. So they went around the country trying to find somebody who knew something about the Ninth Amendment and I remember being in my office at Boston University when I got a phone call from Rob Rach saying that who he was and what he was doing and here and would would I be interested in getting involved in the case and help them write their trial brief on the Ninth Amendment. And I, when I heard the facts, I realized this really was a Ninth Amendment question. If it's a state law, it probably isn't a Ninth Amendment question. It's a 14th Amendment question. It was a federal law, so it really was a Ninth Amendment question. And so I said, sure. And that's what got me involved in that case which also had a Commerce Clause challenge involved as well. But the problem with the Commerce Clause challenge in that case, they, that case won, they won below a theory called necessity, which we don't need to talk about. It went to the Supreme Court. Um, actually, Rob is the one that told me to join the Supreme Court bar so that I could argue that case. He asked me if I was a member of the Supreme Court bar and I said, no, I'm not. He says, well, you should join. I said, Rob, this case isn't going to the Supreme Court. And if it does, I won't be the guy that argues it. He said, no, just join, 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 join the Supreme Court bar. So I did. And the case went to the Supreme Court bar, Court. I wasn't the one that argued it, thankfully. We lost eight to nothing. We'd have lost nine to nothing if Justice Breyer had not recused himself because his brother was the trial judge. Um, and, um, uh, but we had a Commerce Clause count. And the pro- problem with the Commerce Clause count in that case uh, was that in the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, marijuana and money are changing hands. You go into that you, that building with money in your pocket and no marijuana, you come out of the building with marijuana and less money in your pocket, money and marijuana is changing hands. That is the original meaning of commerce. Commerce is happening there. It's interstate commerce, but it's commerce. And so Rob suggest, asked me if I'd be interested in, in bringing another lawsuit and being one of the lawyers to bring another lawsuit that in which uh, his then uh, newly, his, his then is uh, his fiance who became his wife, Angel Rach, 
uh, would be the plaintiff. And we would bring an action in equity to enjoin the application of the Controlled Substance Act to her and to another woman named Diane Monson, who had had her marijuana seized by the DEA. So we actually had standing from her. And whether I'd be one of the lawyers that would bring that, so I said, sure, that would be much better facts than what we've got in OCBC. And so then we brought the Rach case um, because it gave us better facts. And then uh, were you surprised that the Supreme Court took the case? Not when the Ninth Circuit ruled that we were, that we were right. <laughs> It was, <laughs> I was surprised the Ninth Circuit ruled for us. And that's a whole nother story because it was the two liberals on our court that ruled for us on Commerce Clause grounds and the conservative that ruled against us on Wickard versus Filburn grounds. Uh, and so that what happened there and why they did that is a whole nother story. Um, uh, but um, uh, once we won on the Ninth Circuit, there was no surprise the Supreme Court would take it. And then the question is whether we'd be able to prevail in the, in the Supreme Court. And we, as you know, we, we lost, but we lost six to three uh, when many people thought we wouldn't get any votes. And we got three votes. We got Chief Justice Rehnquist, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Thomas. And the, was this the case where you, uh, you recently wrote a kind of a lovely op-ed about Justice Ginsburg uh, questioning him? Yeah, well, it's the, only, it's the only case I've argued in the Supreme Court, and I think the only case I ever will argue in the Supreme Court. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, we had a slippery slope problem in the case, and she, and I was, you know, hoping someone would ask me this, I knew that someone would ask me the slippery slope question, and I was hoping it would be asked in a way that would allow me to explain it well, and she, she asked me in the, she, Justice Ginsburg, asked it, uh, the question of me in the, in the best possible way for me to give my answer. Um, and so I will always be grateful to her for the way she asked me that question. So, and, and then you were pleased though with getting three votes. I was pleased, yeah. Well, look, I knew that we hadn't won the case from oral argument because Justice Kennedy was visibly hostile towards us and we needed all five conservative votes. I didn't think there was really any chance of getting the progressive votes, um, uh, which is an argument, by the way, against some versions of legal realism. Why wouldn't we get the progressive votes? It's a Ninth Circuit case, it's a medical marijuana case. We had very sympathetic facts, we had sympathetic parties. Why wouldn't the progressives vote for us? Well, you know, that's a good question. But I didn't think they would and they didn't. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I walked out the door that day, I'd figured I'd lost. In the months you wait to get the revert, you know, get the decision, you can kind of convince yourself that, well, maybe we have a chance. Maybe Justice Scalia wasn't as skeptical as he seemed. Maybe Justice Kennedy really wasn't as skeptical as he really seemed. Maybe we'd get one of the progressive votes. And then what we got, when, we got the, when we got the result, it was pretty much what we'd expected, what, what I'd expected. And why didn't the progressives go with you? because they put their principal commitment to national power above their compassion for the sick and the dying. And at some level, you kind of have to admire that. And when you got the result, what was your, did you feel like we're done or did you decide to continue to push? On this, on that issue? Uh, uh, generally on kind of using litigation to kind of, um, you know, advance your vision of the constitution. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it's important, and I'll say what, when, uh, what, what happened, but I really think it's important for, for the, the students to know that I don't consider myself a litigator. I consider myself a scholar, an academic, and everything I do is really first and foremost about my scholarship. That's of the highest priority to me, because that's the contribution I think I can make to work, make the world a better place is by speaking the truth exposing something that's real or true. You know, like, like Sanders Bruder wrote that book in 1845 and you know, over a hundred years later, it affected me in a very imp important way, 150 years later. And so I just wanna be on the record with something I think is righter than what other people think. And then someday somebody might find it. That to me is the highest form of accomplishment uh, in terms of making the world a better place. So litigation is really not my thing. Um, and I do consider myself a scholar, although I will say that do, being a litigator taught me a lot about both the legal system and the Commerce Clause and the stuff I, in particular. I learned a lot about constitutional law, which I need as a law professor to know, to teach my students from being a litigator that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't been a litigator. Um, but after the Rach case, it was my opinion. In fact, my the first, the only prepared remarks I made in Rach at the beginning of my oral argument was that if if the court finds for the government in this case that 
Gonzalez versus Raich is going to replace Wickard versus Filburn as the outermost reach of governmental power. And then they jumped in on me at that point. So that was my, that was the only thing I got out of my mouth. Uh, it's the only thing I prepared to say, actually. Um, and so I thought after Raich, there, there would never be another Commerce Clause challenge because there would never be anything the government couldn't do. And none of us imagined just even in the course of the litigation, nobody ever imagined that in addition to regulating commerce and prohibiting Congress, that Congress would ever try to mandate commerce. It was just something that never even entered into our head as a possibility. It would have helped the government fight off their own slippery slope questions if they had imagined that in, in Lopez and, Ray, and, and Morrison, the cases we relied on, it certainly would have helped the government if they could have imagined that as a hypothetical. Well, the government can't man, they can regulate it and can prohibit it, but they can't mandate it. So the government in the Affordable Care Act ended up, do, the Congress ended up doing something no one had ever tried before. And all, all of a sudden, that opened up the possibility of another Commerce Clause challenge. So how did you, how did you think of the Commerce Clause challenge? I mean, did, when the Affordable Care Act was being debated in Congress, did it occur to you at that point, this is unconstitutional? When did you, when did you envision the challenge to the constitutionality of the statute? Well, this goes back to being a contrarian again. <clears throat> um, the Wall Street Journal had an op-ed in September of 2009 while the Affordable Care Act was still bottled up in committee in the Senate, arguing why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. And I read that op-ed and I, my conclusion was that if that's the best argument why it's unconstitutional, then it must be constitutional. And then the next day I was on a blog called the, the Politico had in those days called The Arena. And the way the blog worked is they would post a question every morning and then all the people on the blog could answer it. I mean, it was like 50 or 60 people on this blog. And the board, and the mor that next morning, the blog topic was this Wall Street Journal op-ed about whether the individual insurance mandate would be constitutional or not. And so I woke up and I checked my handheld, um, uh, probably a Treo in those days. And I checked my handheld to see you know, what was up, up my mail before I got out of bed. And sure enough, this was the question of the day. And then I read the first post on this question, which was a very, very snarky post by a law professor at Washington and Lee saying how no serious person could possibly think that this would be unconstitutional. And it was just going over the top like that. So my contrarianism kicked in. And I thought to myself, well, you know, do I want to do, first of all, I thought, do I want to do this today? Because once you, I got to write it out, I got to spend the day dealing with it. It's going to cost, you know, time. I thought, okay, this guy just annoyed me so much that I'll just say, I wrote a blog post saying, well, okay, let's start the old fashioned way. What does the constitution say about this? Does the constitution say a government can do this? Well, no, it doesn't. So what theory can it do it by? And here's the theory. And then I said, you know, it's something that's never been done before. And if, if it's something that never has never been done before, then then there's no precedent that stands against it. There's no precedent saying it's okay, in which case perhaps the court will rule that it's not okay. Um, and that's what got the ball, that's what got the wheels turning. And it wasn't until November uh, when I was actually with a group of people informally at the National Federal Society Lawyers Convention, we were sitting on the hallway and they were talking about the Senate bill. I joined the conversation and one of the fellows there from the Heritage Foundation said, asked me if I would be interested in doing something about this case, this bill. And I said, sure, but I don't have time to write a first draft of anything. I said, I got an idea of, for a guy who can do that. And so he says, whatever we do, we got to do it quickly. And I said, that's fine. And then we wrote a, what, uh, what was called a legal memorandum for heritage about why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. Um, and then we briefed, uh, we had a public event briefing the public about this. And then we had a private event briefing Republican staffers because the Senate, I didn't realize this, but the Senate um, uh, has, a, senators have a power to make a, a constitutional objection. It's called a constitutional point of order. And if they make a constitutional point of order, um, then um, there has to be a full debate and a vote. And the Republicans were not going to make a point of constitutional order, we were told, because nobody on the staff could think of a constitutional objection to make. Well, we had a briefing for the staff as to what our theory was. And uh, it was a private briefing and it was a lot of people in the room from the House and the Senate. And after that, they, the Republicans did make that point of constitutional order. There was a debate on December 23rd, 2009. Um, and uh, they cited our article, they cited that Wall Street Journal piece that, and uh, but it was covered on C-SPAN and it was picked up by talk radio and the media. And, and every single Republican Senator voted that it was unconstitutional. The entire caucus stayed together. <laughs> 
Um, and then the theory was off and running. And the, 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 the law didn't pass until March. But by the time the law passed, uh, the AGs were, in, were uh, had already prepared a lawsuit that was going to be based on that theory that was filed the next day. So, and you know, the uh, the Florida Law Review article that you have um, highlights the fact that this was not an originalist argument. No, you know, you're you're, and would you talk about that? Did you think about making an originalist argument? How is this not an originalist argument? No. Originalism, you know, first of all, even in, in those days, there were only two self-professed originalists, uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas. And Justice Scalia tends to rely on precedent. Um, and he wrote it against us in Rache on Bay of Wickard versus Filburn. So um, originalism didn't have any, there wasn't any particular reason to make an originalist argument. Although in all my briefings in the, in the Rach case um, and in the NFIB case, we make a reference to original meaning because for any justice who might be interested in it, uh, but we're, our, both the Rach case and this case were all based on my understanding of constitutional doctrine. And in the Florida article, I try to explain why it is I saw, how I came to see the doctrine a certain way and most law professors saw it a different way. Um, I think that my view of the doctrine is the right one, but it was all a doctrinal argument based on what the New Deal cases said rather than what they're taught as having said um, and, what the, uh, and what the court actually said in Lopez and Morrison and what the court didn't say in Rach. Um, and so there were many law professors who thought Justice Scalia could never rule for us because of what he had ruled, how he had ruled in Rache. And I knew better than that. I knew that that did not understand what Justice Scalia actually said in his concurring opinion. And there was nothing he said in his concurring opinion that would stop him from ruling for us in Rache. And I knew that. And I figured if there was one person in the country who also knew that, it would be Justice Scalia himself. And he did. So, um, so your argument in you know in Sibelius was consistent with it didn't say Wickard was wrongly decided for example no we had we had a line in the end that's saying if the court believes that to rule for us they have to reverse Wickard versus Filver and we asked them to do so because Justice Thomas requires that you ask the court to reverse a case before he will vote to reverse a case and, and so that was a sentence put in our brief for Justice Thomas that was we said that in Rage um, and um, so yeah, we, we said that, but that's all we said about it. So let me just kind of- we said, uh, you, didn't have, you, didn't, you didn't have to do that. So I have one question. Um, some people might view, this is a student question. Some people might view an effort to um, overturn the ACA as being one that's not about justice. How would you respond to that? Yeah, and another, per, and another uh, student asked about whether um, I view the outcome or result of a case that I would be involved with is relevant to my being involved in it, something like that. They actually, the student asked the question better than I just summarized it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the answer is clear. Um, I don't think I would have devoted scarce time and resources to the Rage case if I didn't think that legalizing marijuana for medical purposes as well as for recreational purposes is not a good policy. I think it is a good policy. Um, that isn't what we argued in the case but that's what I think. And I also think the Affordable Care Act was atrocious public policy, just terrible public policy, detrimental to public health. Uh, and I know that puts me you know, on one side of a debate, um, but uh, throughout that entire litigation, when, every time I went to the Hill to brief uh, con congressmen or staffers, I pleaded with them, the Republicans, these were all Republicans, of course, to come up with an alternative healthcare plan because I thought that would help the court rule for us if the Republicans were visibly behind an alternative uh, healthcare uh, plan, uh, policy, which I thought was very, very possible. That is, there were better plans that you could have besides this terrible one, but they would never do it. They would never do it. From that day to this day, they have not, the Republicans have not uh, um, uh, uh, united behind an alternative to the Affordable Care Act, which I think was a huge policy mistake. And it all think, I think it also undercut our constitutional challenge. Oh, um, another question. Are there any constitutional objections to something like a public option or Medicare for all? Uh, no, not, not under current doctrine. And what do you think, um, if you were on the Supreme Court, um, is that something that you would be troubled by? No, no to, to get to that, you have to deal with the, spe the scope of the spending power. It's, it's, that would be a spending power program. Uh, not a regulation, pro not a regulatory program. Well, the only thing that made the only thing that made the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional, apart from the provision of the Medicare provision proposal, the state mandated Medicare 
proposals that was that was invalidated by the court, which was not part of my case, was not part of my theory. I mean, that was something done by other people. Uh, the only thing that was unconstitutional under existing doctrine was the individual purchase mandate. The rest of the Affordable Care Act was perfectly constitutional under as a regulation of the medical uh, uh, regulation of the insurance business. Now, the problem with that is insurance is not commerce. So under the original meaning of the Commerce Clause, Congress should not be able to regulate insurance. But there was a case decided in 1946 or 1948, um, uh, which in which uh, it's called Southeastern Underwriters, in which the court held that Congress could regulate insurance and reversed a 100 year old precedent, um, Virginia versus something or US v. Virginia. Um, uh, the, anyway, they reversed a precedent to hold that Congress could regulate insurance. And so we couldn't contest that. That was precedent. That was, uh, that was already established doctrine that they could regulate insurance. So if I were on the court, I guess I would, um, you know, as an originalist, I might question that precedent on whether Congress can regulate insurance or not as part of its uh, regulatory power, but not in Medicare for all, because that's a spending power issue. So, um, Kind of a slight shift. One of the students to ask. Can I say one more thing? There, there would be a constitution. There's, there is a. I should say there is a constitutional problem with medic, Medicare for all if it's mandatory Medicare for all and you're not allowed to insure yourself. That is, I mean, which is you know under the British version of the National Health Service, you can buy your own private insurance. Um, it doesn't put. It doesn't put. And that would be more like the you know the public option. Um, uh, you're, it doesn't make illegal private insurance. I think a bill that made illegal private insurance could actually be held unconstitutional to, even today under existing do doctrine. But as long as you're just providing a public option, um, like they do in England, uh, the National Health Service, and not requiring the public option, then, then I think that's just a spending power bill and that would be very difficult to challenge. But if it, if it was only a public option if you hypothetically did away with private insurance, would that be problematic? Well, public option, the, the whole the part, but marketing it as a public option is it's an option. Right, but it, if, um, and I'm not sure what the phrase is, but if it was, if you did away with private insurance and made it just- If it was, if it was Medicare for all, meaning everyone, meaning you, you're in and you can't get out and, and you, can't, you can't insure yourself and private insurance is illegal, um, that would be different. That would be, that would, I think you could challenge that. And on Ninth Amendment grounds, or? I, I mean, this is the kind of thing I would want to do more work on before I opined off the top of my head. And this was not one of the questions. I just want, you're going off script. You've got lots more questions there that, <laughs> that I read beforehand. Sorry. That was actually a student question that came up. Um, well, I already answered it. I already answered <laughs> the question. Asked and answered. Um, in the New York Times, uh, so, a uh, couple things. As someone who, who's taken your class, I know that you often work with and consult senators as they prepare to question and vote on Supreme Court nominees. Can you talk about this process and what it is you try to convey when discussing constitutional theory to a non-lawyer? Well, I actually get to, I did get to participate in the questioning of a justice, a nominee, by, uh, in the senator's um, meeting with the nominees. Senator Paul, I worked on Senator Rand Paul's presidential campaign as an advisor. Not I mean, I was a real advisor, not, not, I was just, I wasn't on just some committee of, of lawyers, but I actually got to be in the room. We did debate prep, debate prep during one of his debate preps that was done in a hotel in Alexandria. I got to, I got to play Chris Christie's part in the reenactment of in the moot debate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, so I've gotten a, uh, to know Rand Paul really well. I really like him a lot. Um, I have a very high re uh, regard for him. And he asked me if I would sit in on his interview with Brett Kavanaugh. Um, and so I did get to sit in on that. It was, it was me, the Senator, uh, Don McGahn, who's White House counsel and the nominee. Um, and uh, Rand all, asked all the questions. Senator, Rand, Senator Paul asked all the questions, not me. He, he's, he has his own independent views on the Constitution, which are very impressive. But then he turned to me at the end. He said, do you have any questions for the nominee? And I said, well, I have two. One is, do you consider yourself an originalist? And he answered yes. And the second is, will you say that in your hearing? And he answered yes. And that was my two questions. Those are the two questions I got to ask. Um, and those were really important to me because uh, for 30 years after Robert Bork was defeated uh, and he was self-identified as an originalist, no Republican nominee would call themselves an originalist after that. And then uh, Justice Gorsuch did during his hearings and Professor Solom had testified actually at his confirmation hearings based on that because he had identified himself as an originalist. 
Um, and I thought it would really be a step backwards and could actually be used against us in academia if the next justice who was appointed didn't want to call himself an originalist. And in fact, Justice Kavanaugh had never called himself an originalist in print. He called himself a constitutional textualist. He had avoided the word, the label. And I thought it would actually be a setback for us in academia if the second justice after Justice Gorsuch wouldn't call himself an originalist. So it mattered to me whether he did call him, he did consider himself an originalist, and then also would he say so? Um, and so I was very pleased to get that, uh, um, that, get that uh, answer. And is uh, Professor or Judge, uh, Judge Barrett also an originalist? She is a self-professed originalist in her scholarship. Uh, but as uh, many, of the, uh, many of the students may know, she's a big critic of mine. Um, and she was hammered during her hearings for uh, agreeing with the four dissenters in um, uh, Affordable Care Act challenge about Justice, Robert, Justice Roberts' saving construction move and saying that she thought that he had distorted the text in order to uphold it. She got a lot of criticism for that, but that's the last five pages of a commentary, a symposium piece she wrote on my book. The first 20 pages of it is her disagreeing with me about the proper role of judges uh, who are originalists. So, um, so yes, she is an originalist. Um, she's a knowledgeable originalist. That is, she understands the theory of the modern theory of originalism, as is evidenced both in her writings and her testimony. But she doesn't agree with. She doesn't share my view about exactly how judges should go about doing their job. Uh, an originalist justice should go about doing their job. So we don't agree a hundred percent. But I think uh, I have no doubt whatsoever she's an originalist and calls herself that, and was able to talk very, very eloquently about originalism in her hearing. And, and what's the difference between your originalism and, and Judge uh, Barrett's? I, I, I knew you were going to ask that. It's not a difference in originalism. It has to do with the role of judges. So mm -hmm. my last book, um, Our Republican Constitution, was not about originalism. It was about what is the role of a judge in a constitutional republic. And it was an argument against judicial res uh, a, a, a judicial restraint. Uh, which was originally a progressive mantra, and then it became a conservative mantra. So it was really a book, that last book was a book critical of conservatives. This is where I'm a contrarian with conservatives um, in the Federal Society Coalition. Um, and she's really on the other side of that. She's on a more, she's more of a Justice Scalia judicial restraint person than I think is correct. So that means you're going to get more deference to legislatures on public policy out of her than you would out of me. Um, and that should actually be some good news um, to many Democrats, but they didn't focus on the 20 pages of that, uh, uh, that article where I'm sure they agree with her. Uh, they just focused on the five pages of the article where she agreed with me. So do you think originalism was represented fairly at the confirmation hearings? Did people, uh, you know, did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Uh, you know, I think that the Republican senator who talked about it got it right. Um, J Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is just all over the map on originalism. He's, he always asks these, these skeptical questions about originalism that I find frustrating. I just want to get in the room with Senator Kennedy and just have it out with him about what originalism is and isn't, uh, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, and the Democrats were largely avoiding originalism. Some of them who talked about it talked about it in predictably inaccurate ways, but most of them were just talking about the results of cases that they thought she would rule a way they didn't like. and. and um, that really wasn't about originalism. I mean, they asked a bunch of questions about originalism that I think were mostly wrong. I mean, in the sense that they were about framers' intentions and you know how the you know you know the, the original constitution didn't protect women, which is which is wrong. The original constitution did protect women. Um, the amendments certainly protect women. Um, so there was a lot of questions that were about a framers' intent, which is remember that's the view of originalism that I rejected when I went with. Spooner over the Garrisonians. And a lot of the questions were coming from the Garrisonian perspective, that the Constitution was a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. So a lot of modern critics of originalism essentially adopt the Garrisonian view as the correct view. And so did Chief Justice Taney and Dred Scott. The, he adopted the Garrisonian view, but embraced it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So let me ask you, so originalism right now tends to be associated with a conservative political outlook. Uh, one of the students asks, is there anything inherent to originalism that makes it more appealing to or logically associated with conservatives, or is it compatible with all political persuasions? 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult question to answer because it is compatible. It, it, uh, originalism will yield progressive results. I think it would have yielded progressive results in the medical marijuana case, for example, Pro progressive policy results. It, it real. In fact, my, my, my talking point during that litigation was federalism is not just for conservatives. If you, want, if you want California to win, federalism is not just for conservatives. I would say the same thing about, about originalism. Originalism is not just for conservatives on policy grounds. However, there is, it, it's complicated because I do think that the original constitution, even as amended, gets in the way of some uh, national legislation that progressives would like to see pass that would be outside the powers of Congress to enact, like the Affordable Care Act, or at least the individual insurance mandate, part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and or the regulation of insurance that would be beyond, and so that if if what you would like to see is more uh, lawmaking at the state level where you have 50 state solutions to social and economic problems and less at the national level um, if you would if if you like that vision you're more likely to be a conservative if you don't like that vision I think you're more likely to be a progressive um, and so there's that sense in which the original meaning of the Constitution does tend to trail does tend to favor those who like a decentralized, a more decentralized legal system or policy making system than we currently have. So I'm just trying to think, so like Lochner, for example, uh, essentially is overturning a state progressive right. Right. action. Um, so in that context, right. uh, so you would Well, think first of all, mm -hmm. I, I like Lochner a lot. I think it's, you know, one of the best uh, decisions the Supreme Court ever reached, which but conservatives don't agree with that. Uh, so this makes me a contrarian for conservatives. Justice Roberts in the, Chief Justice Roberts in the, his Obergefell dissent invoked the name Lochner 17 times as though simply saying Lochner over and over again was an argument that just showed how terrible the majority was being because it's Lochner, it's Lochner, it's Lochner. So Lochner is not popular amongst conservatives. Um, and it would not be, and, and in fact, that was what uh, Judge Barrett was, then Professor Barrett pushing back at me on in my, in her, in her review of my book and her commentary on my book. Um, so I would see some, uh, but what I would see, is, I would like to see is um, uh, just more skept judicial skepticism about when local economic regulations are actually public interest and in, when they are actually rent seeking efforts to protect privileged uh, groups privileged interest groups, in particular privileged business interest groups from competition from other, pe from other people, usually smaller mom and pop operations. I, I would like to see more judicial skepticism about the use of the police power than conservatives and progressives would like to see. And that's, and that's why, you know, you think that the Lochner decision was a good decision because it was scrutinizing yeah. some, you know, protecting some businesses over others. Right, and I just want to point out that that the that that was one it only scrutinized one provision of an extensive regulation of the bake shop industry called the bake shop act which regulated all kinds of, provided all kinds of health and safety requirements on bake shops um, in the state of new york none of which was challenged and all of which was approved by that court they, the the text of the bake shop law was actually in the majority opinion and they had no problem with the rest of it as a public health matter, public health met quest, uh, provision. It was only the maximum hours law, which was actually added at the behest of the bake shop unions, um, which they questioned as perhaps being uh, put in there for other motives because there was not an adequate connection with public health. That was the only thing questioned in Lochner. So let me just, a couple of kind of larger questions that the students have asked. Uh, one asks, uh, and actually several have asked, how originalism can be justified when the Constitution was written by only white upper class men, many of whom own people as slaves? Um, what, what would your response to that critique be? Well, there's a number of responses, but, the, but I already gave one of them at the beginning, and that is that um, the Constitution as amended was not written by them. The Constitution as amended was written by lots of other people. Uh, including the members of the 39th Congress that wrote the 14th Amendment, as well as those who wrote the 13th and 15th Amendments, and as well as those that wrote the 19th Amendment. So the Constitution that we have today was not written in, in its entirety in those days. And much of these amendments, what these amendments have done um, is extended the benefits of the Constitution, which may have been skewed in one direction, extended the benefits that the Constitution provides to that to provided to some people, it extends those benefits to everybody. So if you think the original structure that was established by the Constitution was on balance beneficial 
and beneficial to the people that it benefited, then extending those benefits to everybody would make it better. And that is what subsequent amendments successfully did. Uh, now, you could take issue and you could say, well, even as originally developed, the structure is actually not beneficial to other people. It's only beneficial. You could say today, the structure, the original structure was, only, was picked for their benefit and it remains for their benefit. I can understand that as an intellectual position. I disagree with it. I think the original structure, uh, which was skewed to benefit some, once the benefits of that were spread to everybody, the original structure itself is still beneficial. So now, Ida Adibi writes, uh, and this is a new question, without an equal okay, right. Let me, let me just say one more thing, though. Um, I, I, would, I, I think that most people who are in favor of amending the Constitution, because to make it a better Constitution, they want their amendment interpreted according to its original meaning. They don't mm -hmm. want a subsequent court saying, you know, say the ERA had been added to the Constitution. Do they really want a living constitutionalist conservative court to say, no, 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 we're not going to follow that, the original meaning of the Equal Rights Amendment? Uh, because we don't like it. No, they want the Equal Rights Amendment interpreted according to its original meaning. They don't want judges overruling it. So um, that's another reason why I think originalism is, the, is, is defensible uh, with respect to a constitution that's been amended the way ours has. So the kind of a, actually, I think this question relates to that. Um, Ada Adibi writes, without an Equal Rights Amendment, how are the benefits extended to everybody of the constitution? Well, the, the Constitution doesn't uh, say, the Constitution protects citizens and it protects persons. And it doesn't introduce gender, uh, except in one provision of the 14th Amendment, which feminists uh, or women's rights advocates uh, were very much opposed to. So it led some of them to oppose the 14th Amendment altogether because it had protected the rights of male persons to vote. And that was the first time gender got introduced uh, into the text of the Constitution. Of course, that was corrected by the 19th Amendment. Um, but other than that, if the Constitution doesn't have sex or gender, doesn't reference sex or gender at all. Uh, and one of the objections made by a Southern a senator to Lysander Spooner's theories of interpretation in Congress, in a speech in, on the floor of Congress, is that if you follow Spooner's method of interpretation, women could run for president. And there was nothing stopping a woman from being president of the United States. And he viewed that as a reductio ad absurdum of Spooner's public meaning approach. But I would view that as a virtue of Spooner's public meaning approach. Hmm. So, um, and now a philosophical question from Caleb R. Or, um, how does Professor Barnett, and again, this is a new question, square an Aristotelian and Thomas conception of justice with a consent-based conception of justice, where Thomism doesn't permit consent to practices like usury? For example, well, last, I, you, you, you sort of got distorted on the last part of that question. Where Thomas what? Where Thomism does not permit the consent to practices like uh, usury. Uh, oh. And then, for example, on Lochner or the contemporary movement among libertarians to find a guaranteed economic liberty in the 14th Amendment. Right. Um, well, I'm not saying I agree with, I, I don't actually know all of Thomas's public policy views um, and his views on, you know, what he thinks is moral or not. When I say I'm an Aristotelian Thomist, I mean that I believe that human beings do have a basic nature. Um, I mean that in a more general, the most general sense, this is a nature that all humans share in common, regardless of when and where they are born and who the, and what their, and what their gender is. Um, and on, based on that nature, they need to be able to actualize their potential. And to do that is somewhat of a do it yourself affair that you, to be virtuous is something you have to be yourself. You, if you just follow orders to, and you're doing all, all the right things, that doesn't make you virtuous. Virtuous is the choice. Uh, to recognize what is the right thing to do and then to do it. And then, so in order to actually be truly virtuous and therefore be truly happy and pursue real happiness, um, not pleasure, but happiness and satisfaction, um, then you need to understand what virtue, where virtue lies and then you have to pursue virtue even when it's not the easy path to take. Um, and so I believe all of those things. That's my view of ethics. Mm -hmm. My views of justice um, that is, um, uh, is based on more on individual rights, and that's more of an enlightenment concept. You see a proto, you, you see elements of that in the Summa Theologica, where Thomas says that it, it is not, the human law should not ban all vices, he said. It should only ban the more grievous ones, such as murder, robbery, and the like, murder, theft, and the like. So I think he's actually moving towards what I would call a natural rights perspective there, but he doesn't adopt one. 
That's more of an enlightenment concept when it comes to political theory. And rights are a political theory concept. They're not, necess- they're not just an ethical concept, except in so far as you have an ethical duty to, ad- to respect the rights of others, a moral duty. So let me just now move to another kind of series of questions are about ideological diversity and advice for students. Um, so, but let me just kind of start off with, you were a Goldwater supporter um, in 1964. Uh, and, I <laughs> and I think you found some, your speech on behalf of Goldwater um, recently. Um, yeah, sir. yeah. Well, I I found my handwritten notes for my summary, my summation. Of my, I, deba- I debated on behalf of Barry Goldwater when I was 12 years old in front of the entire junior high school student body. It was probably seven or 800 students in the gym. Um, and I, I found our debate notes, which were actually mimeographed. But on the back of them is my handwritten summation, the last words of this debate, uh, where I say, when you go, and this goes to my contrarianism and, and et cetera. So when you go to vote tomorrow, you will all be, you will, you will all be, you will be all alone. I've got to read my own handwriting, by the way, if I was 12 years old handwriting, which is very much like my handwriting today. Uh, when you go to vote tomorrow, you will be all alone with nobody uh, urging you, with, with nobody pushing or threatening you. Yes, when you go to vote tomorrow, you will not be fooled by, um, uh, what, what I said, now this is the funny part. I was going to edit this out, but I'm going to say it. An obvious socialist and leftist, okay, but I'm saying it. Um, no, you will not be fooled because when you go to vote for tomorrow, you will vote for Barry M. Goldwater because in your heart, underline, you know, quadruple underline, he's right. Thank you. In your heart, you know he's right, which was his campaign slogan. In your heart, you know he's right. But so, you got to kick yourself away. From, you got to fight peer pressure. When you're in voting booth, you're just going to be all by yourself. You can do it all by yourself. No one's going to be there telling you what to do. So, so just do it. So you're, you're, you've been fighting for your fresher for a long time. I have it. I was, one of a very, I was one of a very few Jews growing up in Calumet City and my graduating, I'd say another student asked this question, in my graduating class of 400, there were four Jews. And so, and I had to fight, you know, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. It was a Polish Catholic town. There was, I used to have to fight, you know, fist fight stuff, you know, because I, I was Jewish a little bit, not a lot, but just a little bit. Um, so there was a lot of, there, and then, but then when I, where we went to synagogue was in Hammond, Indiana, because there were no Jews in Calumet City. So when I went to synagogue in Hammond, Indiana, there were, everybody was on the sort of progressive or liberal side. And so I was a minority and I was a minority as a Jewish and somewhat of as a conservative as well in Calumet City. But then I was a minority as a conservative and a, then I was a conservative in Hammond amongst the Jews and also from the wrong side of the tracks because Calumet City was a very, very kind of a lower class, um, working class town. And the, the people on uh, the other side of the line kind of looked down their noses at, at Calumet City. So uh, yeah, that's from my earliest days, I, I was kind of on, on my own. So, so the question that you referred to was, you grew up as someone different from most of the rest of your community. One of the profiles mentioned that you were one of four Jewish students in your high school graduating class. How has this impacted your career? Well, I think it has, and this goes to other questions I was asked, it, it, has, it has allowed me to basically try to think, think for myself and speak my mind, even when everybody around me is thinking and think, speaking differently. I'm not completely successful at that. I, I have conforming opinions because they're conforming opinions like everybody else. But I think I, I'm, I, I'm both inclined to resist it because I'm a contrarian and I'm able to resist it because I'm used to doing so. Um, under some circumstances. And so it's very handy if you, to have those qualities if you're a scholar, um, because you'll see things, as I said earlier, you're, you'll both see things that other people don't see, and then you'd be willing to say them and not be so afraid that if I say this, this is going to put me on the out. Like if I talk about respectfully about the Ninth Amendment that everybody dumps on and makes jokes about, like, well, what are you going to argue, the Ninth Amendment? Um, mm-hmm. Meaning you have no case. That I can just I'll say it, I'll throw it out there, and I'll be able to, you know, handle the blowback I get, which I do, for saying something that's different. So, um, you know, one of the things you talked about was sitting in tribes constitutional law class and, you know, reading text of the Constitution that it resonated with you, but then tribe would talk about the case law. And though 
he didn't say it, but you know that he had a, a you know I assume a progressive take in his class. You know, I assume I don't remember. I don't remember. So but one I... question. So one question is, what advice do you have for students struggling to appreciate a course because their viewpoints are not reflected in the curriculum? My number one piece of advice is suspend your disbelief in what your professor is saying, which is what I did not do, and try to get inside your professor's head to try to see the world the way your professor does and try to know as much as that professor knows. It would be a tremendous benefit to you if you actually knew what your professor knows about the subject that they're teaching you. Um, and if, you do, if, you're in, if you're mentally in resistance mode, in which you, you're, you think it's your job to figure out where the professor is wrong because you know they're wrong politically, so you're trying to refute them, um, you're going to miss out on what that professor has to offer. And I was in resistance mode as a law student, and I don't think I learned in my, my classes, and my grades reflected the fact that I didn't learn in my classes um, uh, what the professor had to offer until I started taking classes like from Ronald Dworkin and stuff that, that I just got into and I really in, independently enjoyed. Um, and so I would say, um, don't worry about losing yourself uh, just because you suspend your disbelief, because if you really do have principles, um, you, shouldn't, you won't lose yourself. And maybe your principles aren't as right as you think they are. Maybe they deserve to be modified. So, and then in, in who won the healthcare case? Kind of similar, you mentioned that law professors exist in an ideological bubble where people like you are, don't exist, you know, and that, you know, I mean, there was a consensus that it was an easy case, but not an easy case in the way you were arguing that, you know, that it was, a, you know, this was clearly constitutional. Um, why, um, how have you navigated the, your relationships with, with people who disagree with you? And one thing that Justice Ginsburg would say, you know, is that you can disagree without being disagreeable. Is that, do you think that's right? Well, I try. I mean, I don't know if I succeed. I think that's, that's a virtue to aspire to. Um, I mean, the number one th rule I adopted since the first time I entered academia is to not really pick arguments with my colleagues. There is, you're, not, uh, you're not under any moral obligation to disagree with somebody just because they happen to occupy the office next to you. Um, I go about my own business. I mind my own business. I, I express my views in my writing and in my, later in my speeches and other public things. I don't express my views that much to my colleagues. Uh, unless they ask me. I have found over the years that if you don't push your views on your colleagues, they oftentimes come and ask you what they are. And they're the ones that are actually have an open mind or they wouldn't be asking you. And then if I'm asked what my views are, I will tell them, but I don't push my views on people. And I think, Bill, I think you can test, I mean, I don't know. I, I, you don't see how I act, but um, I don't think in faculty meetings, I don't participate that much. And, and I'm, I'm constantly around people that are disagreeing disagreeing with, but I don't speak up all that much unless I feel like I have something that will actually advance the discussion. Um, and I have to say, you know, you're, I have always impressed you're very thoughtful and, you know, and you do have the, you know, Justice Ginsburg approach of, you know, being able to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, so. And I, I, it's also very important to me that I don't impose my views on my students, mm -hmm. too. Uh, I don't like professors who do that. I try not to. On the other hand, I also don't like professors who hide their views on the subject matter. Not on. I don't think. Ex, I don't think extraneous views are necessary. But on the subject matter, I I give the students my views, but I try to make it clear that they don't need they, that they don't need to agree with me. But I think I should need at least tell them what they are. I was always frustrated by the pure Socratic method, where everybody where they keep de deconstructing everything, but they never tell you what they think. And I, even as a first year law student, I thought, you know, I'm old enough. I promise you, I won't be overly swayed by what you say, but just tell me what you think. I'm paying you. I'd like mm -hmm. to know what you think about torts, your view. Now, one thing I loved about Roberto Unger, who was my contracts professor, and that's how I ended up being a contract scholar, is he did tell us what he thought. And, uh, he, and, and my fellow classmates went to the dean to complain about him. I found this out when I visited there. The professors told me it was the only year he taught contracts because my section complained so vociferously about him. And their complaint was, He's, we're learning Unger and we're not learning contracts. And, my, and I heard them say that as a classmate. And I said, look, I don't care about contracts. This is interesting. I care about an interesting course. I don't care about contracts. I care about criminal law. 
Hmm. And it turns out when I went to be a contracts professor, I knew a whole lot about contracts. And the only place I ever would have learned it was not in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, but was in Roberto Unger's class. So that my classmates were wrong. We were learning contracts, but we were also learning Unger. And that is what provoked me to be a, a, a contract scholar, was reacting to him and trying to prove why he was wrong. And then um, another healthcare question. We're living during a time when health and public safety are intertwined in such a way that's led to constraint on individual and economic liberty in an attempt to contain the spread of a deadly pandemic. What are your thoughts on the expansion of these powers in select instances where the government aims to prevent an impending crisis? Yeah, this, this is a really difficult question uh, that I think we should be talking a lot more about. And I haven't written about it. My co-author, Josh Blackman, has a long paper about this that's now probably on SSRN which I've only read some of, and I think it's something we need to be careful about. Uh, my view is that, you, that judges should be skeptical about the assertions of government power. Some of the issues that are raised by the current pandemic are separation of powers issues within the state, on state constitutional grounds, because governors are exercising powers that might go beyond that, which they've been delegated by their state legislatures. Um, but I think that I, the way I view due process clause working and the, reason, and the way justices should be skeptical in ways that, for example, Judge Barrett disagrees with me about, is that judges should be skeptical and they should be making essentially evidence-based uh, decisions based on adversarial presentations to them of what is the evidentiary support for a particular governmental law uh, action. And in the early days of a pandemic, when you don't know very much, I think that basically the benefit would go to the government. But as you learn more, um, and, a, and, a, and a factual or empirical critique can be made to a, a restriction on liberty as being unnecessary and also perhaps improper, at that point, uh, you might, judges might take a bit more of a skeptical view of these, these laws. But that would depend on having to, the government having to justify what it's doing empirically. Um, so that's how I would see things differently than now, which is just sort of blanket judicial deference to whatever the government does, uh, whatever state governments do. Um, I think that would be, a, I think that's a mistake. So um, final question, because amazingly, we're almost through our time. And I just want to thank you. This was really, this was an extraordinary conversation. And, uh, you know, it's really fascinating to be able to talk to you about you know, your vision of the Constitution and what you've tried to do with your career and about your life, which is really, you know, I, I think the, you know, that's really the purpose of, um, you know, of this class, you know, the, to be able to talk about, you know, how people decide to follow the career path that they follow and, you know, what, what they've, where they found success, where they found frustration, you know, and, and you know, how they move forward. So I, I just want to thank you so much for uh, for taking the time and talking to the class. Um, and then, you know, what I we do at the end of the class is we have kind of a summative question. So, and the question is, you are often the first and sometimes the only voice advocating for a particular point of view. How did you learn to trust yourself in the face of so much opposition? And how can our students learn to do the same? Well, first you have to choose a contrarian dad. So I would go back in time and I would choose to be influenced by a dad who's very contrarian, but you can't do that. Um, and so you just need to try to seek out um, opposing views to the one that you're being told uh, because there almost always are opposing views to the one that's being told. And one of the advantages of being, of being a minority like I am, an ideological minority, is, is that I'm inundated with the opposing view. I don't have to seek it out. It's all over the place. I, it's, you know, trying to get away from it is my problem. Um, and so I have to deal with, with the opposing view every day of my life. Every, almost every hour of every day, I'm engaging with ideas. If you're in the majority, then you've got a problem. Then, because you have to affirmatively go and seek out maybe people like me. Um, and um, that's going to take some effort on your part. So uh, that's what I would do. And then if, if you actually think that the opposing view makes some sense, even though there are, it's a minority view, then, you know, I don't know how to tell you to be prepared to sort of accept a, the, your minority status as an ideological minority, but um, I can tell you there are rewards for having done so. If I, if I didn't have something different to say, I doubt I'd be a Georgetown law professor today. Um, and so there are a lot of rewards uh, in being a, in the minority. If, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, I'm in great demand because there aren't that many like me. I have to turn down a lot more invitations and opportunities that I can accept because they're not a lot of people like me. And so there are advantages to being in a minority, 
uh, as opposed to being in the majority. So well, I have to say, you know, I, I've learned so much from our conversations over the years. And uh, it's really, I'm really delighted that, you know, we've had this opportunity so that, you know, our students can hear you, you know, talk through all of these issues, not just the students who are fortunate enough to take your class, but, you know, all of the students in this class. So, you know, I just want to thank you again, you know, for, uh, for this conversation. Particularly, I just want to highlight, in case everybody doesn't know this, uh, Professor Barnett is a big Chicago Bears fan. And he, he has missed a big part of today's game in order to be with you. So in every perspective, you know, thank you so much. And we hope the Bears win. The uh, Bears. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for joining us. So uh, take care, stay well, and I will see you next week. And again, thank you so much, Professor Barnett. Take care, all. Bye.